listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, mom, photographer, award-winning volunteer, and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is another special bonus edition of Lighthearted. A week from today, December 16th, is a very special day for one of America's favorite lighthouses, Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. Michelle, please help me tell everyone about Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and our guests. Sure, Jeremy. Offshore from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, the Gulf Stream collides with the Virginia Drift, a branch of the Labrador Current from Canada. This current forces mariners heading south toward a dangerous 12-mile-long sandbar called Diamond Shoals. Countless shipwrecks there have led to the nickname Graveyard of the Atlantic. A lighthouse was first authorized at Cape Hatteras in 1794, and the station began service in 1803. The first sandstone tower was 90 feet tall. Even at that considerable height, it was too short to effectively warn ships of the Diamond Shoals. In 1853, the tower was raised to a height of 150 feet. By the 1860s, it was decided that instead of extensive repairs to the old tower, a new one would be built. Construction began in 1868, and the new tower went into service on December 16, 1870. It got its famous black and white spiral day mark three years later, making it easier to tell apart from the other area lighthouses. At 198 feet, it's the tallest lighthouse in the United States and the second tallest brick lighthouse in the world. Cape Hatteras Light Station was transferred to the National Park Service in 1937. Over the years, efforts were made to stabilize the beach in front of the lighthouse as the ocean crept closer. After years of study and much debate, the lighthouse was moved 2,900 feet from its original position in 1999. The keeper's houses and other light station buildings were also moved. The National Park Service continues to manage the lighthouse and keeper's quarters, as well as conducting public tours. The Outer Banks Lighthouse Society actively supports all North Carolina lighthouses. Bette Paget has served on the organization's board of directors since 1999 and is serving her second stint as president. Bet is a North Carolina native who taught guitar at NC State University for 29 years. She continues to teach music, and she also writes and performs original music. John Havel is a New Jersey native who's lived in North Carolina for more than 40 years. His love for Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and its history led to John becoming a board member of the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society, and he serves as the historian for Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. I had a chance last week to talk with Bette Paget and John Havel about next week's 150th anniversary event, among other things. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking with Bette Paget and John Havel, and we're speaking through the magic of Zoom. Uh, they're both at their homes in North Carolina. I'm up here in New Hampshire. It's a beautiful day in both places. I can see the sunlight streaming in their windows. Thank you so much for being with me today, Bet and John. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank, for thank you, right, for having us. You're very welcome. We're going to be discussing the a very special anniversary celebration that's coming up at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse next week, 150th anniversary. But before we get into that, I'd just like to ask you a couple of other things, a little bit about your personal background and involvement. I'll ask Bet first. How did your love affair with Cape Hatteras Lighthouse begin, and what's so special about it to you? It all began with a song that I wrote about the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, and I really didn't know that much about the lighthouse or its history, and so I I did a lot of research about the lighthouse and the people there, and I visited the lighthouse and got to know a lot of the people of the community, and It led to an entire album about the lighthouse, which caused me to go to the Outer Banks and get to know the people in the lighthouse's story. And I I guess I just fell in love with it. I want to talk about this song a little bit more in a few minutes. But first, let me ask John the same question. What exactly led you to Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and why is it so special to you? The answer to that is that my father uh, was an iron worker and did beautiful decorative ironwork after the Second World War. 
he also was an amateur engineer and uh, gave me a love of architecture and art. And although I had visited the lighthouse before I married my wonderful wife, Aida, in 2003 and four, once we visited in those years, just after the move, I was awestruck by the incredible Victorian ironwork and architecture of the lighthouse. And the more I asked questions to the historians there, the more questions it arose. And it, it is now a, a lifelong pursuit of mine. You kind of alluded to it just now, but you've done extensive research into the history of Cape Hatteras Lighthouse for years. And I hear uh, through the grapevine, you're actually working on a book about it. Do you want to say a little bit about that? I have been researching the book for 16 years, <laughs> and I'm a graphic designer by career, and I am really not a great writer. At least uh, I've written four or five pieces, but uh, it's so, so difficult for me to actually sit down and write. But the truth is, yes, I'm working on a book. You know, I have several role models for that, and I do have numerous pieces of the chapters, and I know what it's going to look like when it's finished, but it's still got a long way to go. Okay. Well, we won't hold you to any deadlines, but let's just say we're all looking forward to it. Well, let me just say you'll have tennis balls on your walker by the time it's published. <laughs> well, that's not very far away. So uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people look forward to that. Bet, let's get back to uh, the music you talked about. I know you are a musician and songwriter, and I, I've seen uh, you performing the song Hatteras of a Lighthouse Could Speak on YouTube. I think people can find at least one performance, maybe more than one performance of that on YouTube. Probably, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful song. It's been performed at ceremonies and events over the years. I'm sure it's going to be performed as part of the uh, what's happening next week. At least I would guess that it, maybe it is. Well, that's a good guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's really cool that the Lighthouse has its own song. I was noodling around on the guitar um, in a new tuning, and um, I plucked a few strings and just out of my mouth, from somewhere came the words, I am a lighthouse. This was in 1997 when the lighthouse was gaining national, international attention because of the erosion and people were wondering what's going to happen to the lighthouse. And so I really, I didn't know anything about Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, but I figured that this is what that song was about, that somewhere in the back of my mind, the attention that was being brought to Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is what came to mind when I came out with those words. Mm -hmm. So not knowing anything really about the lighthouse other than I visited it in the 1980s, I started doing research and um, looking on the internet and reading books. I read Cheryl Shelton Roberts' book, uh, Lighthouse Families, and learned more about the families that lived at the lighthouse and um, ended up making phone calls to the National Park and talking to Ranny Jeanette, the, last, uh, the son of the last lighthouse keeper, and talking to volunteers there. And by the time the pen hit the paper, the song had actually written itself. It's a, it's a history of the lighthouse um, told from first person and about um, the issue of the erosion. That, that's how that song came to be. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when the funds came through to move the lighthouse, I was encouraged by the National Park and also by the North Carolinas Arts Council to do an entire album about the lighthouse. And so it, visiting uh, the lighthouse and the community and people um, who had grown up there at the lighthouse and what it meant to them, listening to both sides of the relocation, the people who were dead set against it and those who were absolutely for it, it became an entire album of seven songs um, about the lighthouse, the history, how people worldwide feel about it. So that's how that song came to be. Is that album still available if people want to get it? Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's available on CD Baby. That's easy enough to, to find. Right. <laughs> uh, so, Bet, you're president of the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society. John, you're also very involved with the society, of course. Maybe, I don't know if you want to take this bet, but how long has the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society been around and what exactly does it do? We were formed in 1994. I could go into some history about that, but um, 
and want to tell a little bit more about what we do and, and our mission statement is that we aid in the preservation of the lighthouses and maritime history of North Carolina and we work with National Park Service and other agencies, both government and nonprofit groups, to achieve the safekeeping of the buildings, the artifacts and the records of the United States Lighthouse Establishment, which it became the Lighthouse Board, the Bureau of Lighthouses and the United States Lighthouse Service. Our mission is to preserve and educate. And um, so that's what we do. We, we advocate for all the lighthouses in North Carolina. When we first got started uh, in 1994, it was mainly to bring attention to Body Island Lighthouse. Um, it had never had any restorative work since it was built in 1872. And when our founders, Cheryl Shelton Roberts and Bruce Roberts, visited the lighthouse in 1991 um, from Virginia for a photo shoot, they were absolutely appalled at the condition of the lighthouse. And so they soon found themselves moving to North Carolina. They built a gift shop and they talked to people, um, you know, all their customers, all day long about the condition of the lighthouses and garnered enough interest to form a nonprofit organization, which was the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society. The main purpose was to get funds to restore Body Island Lighthouse, but the issue of the erosion at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse um, became a very strong concern and that's where our focus went. And then Curry Tuck Beach Lighthouse was it was claimed to be surplus property by the United um, States Coast Guard, and so that's where our focus went. And then um, many of the other lighthouses needed help or support in in various ways, and so we started trying to help all the lighthouses, and all the at the same time were trying to garner enough interest from uh, the United States Coast Guard to save um, Body Island Lighthouse. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of our beginnings. And now our focus is to get children to visit our lighthouses. We have a grant so that chi um, kids can visit the lighthouses. They're, they're the keepers of the future. And um, we hope that the young people will continue an interest in lighthouses and the keepers and their families and keep the stories alive. Uh, we publish an award-winning newsletter and it's not just about our society but it's about the lighthouses of North Carolina, their history, um, the maritime history and we also publish a brochure which is placed in the visitor centers all across North Carolina and um, it brings people to the Outer Banks and, and the entire coast of North Carolina to visit our lighthouses. So um, those are a few of the things we do. We also have helped the National Park in preparing Body Island Lighthouse lens for uh, storage while the lighthouse was restored, and we um, helped put together the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse lens in the graveyard of Atlantic. Um, there are just, you know, numerous things that we do. So there's been a lot of anniversaries lately. Last year was the 25th anniversary of the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society. It was also the 20th anniversary of the move of the lighthouse, in, of Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in 1999. As you said, that was a huge project that got a lot of national attention. John, you wrote an article about uh, last year's anniversary event, the 20 year anniversary of the move. And what was special about that for you? I was not here at all during the move. I got involved around 2003 and four. However, I am so blessed, so so very blessed that by the time the 10th anniversary came in 2009, my wife and I, uh, Aida and I attended that event. And at that event is when we met Bruce and Cheryl Roberts. Also, I got to meet Mike Boer, who was the official photographer for the move and lived at the site the entire time the lighthouse was being moved, as well as Joe Jacobic, who was uh, international chimneys uh, manager for the move, and and I'm very blessed to say that they are now among my best friends, and I am the recipient of a lot of information from them. In, in terms of the 20th anniversary of the move, there was only a small committee of five or six people, and as Bet mentioned uh, with the society, the Park Service is both smart and very magnanimous in always making us partners because they need the volunteers and the manpower, Aida and I ended up being major, major partners for the 20th anniversary. And I designed the programs, name tags, we chose a lot of the speakers, 
and we were involved in that. Aida was a moderator for the panel that took a place in that, and uh, it was just an amazing, wonderful thing, and that was July 1st of uh, 2019. I, I heard about it at the time, that it was a, a great event. I'd like to talk for, for a moment about a more recent history, very recent history. I don't know which one of you wants to take this, but could you comment on the uh, experiment that has just happened? Can you explain the experiment involving using dry ice at the lighthouse? What was that all about? Matt, do you mind if I feel that first? Uh, please do. So I was actually there uh, present. Because I'm involved in the 150th, I'm, I'm making a lot of trips to the lighthouse, which is only 30 minutes from my home where I live now. So I'm down there quite often. And uh, one of the young rangers told me a few uh, days before it happened that there was going to be this test. So I made sure I was there that day. Dave Hallett, the superintendent of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore, was there and uh, numerous reporters uh, showed up for this as well because it was such an interesting uh, thing that they were doing. And basically a company from Newport News, Virginia, Hydro Prep is the name of the contractor, came down to test how to remove paint from the surface inside and outside. This day they were just doing it on the outside without actually abrading the brick at all or doing any damage to the architecture or the structure of the lighthouse. I can tell you in 1976, the lighthouse was completely stripped of paint, but it was very, <laughs> uh, let's just say, non-preservation. Uh, they just sandblasted the whole thing. There was probably a lot of damage to it. So this time, uh, using dry ice pellets, they are shooting through the pressure washer you know, uh, they were all on a cherry picker lift doing that. And they were testing no nozzles and other pressure on that day. But they, uh, for the uh, actual restoration of the lighthouse that's supposed to take place next year, they're going to remove all of the paint inside and out. This is a question for either of you. I think you were both involved in this. But could you say a bit about the, the lens panels, the Fresnel lens panels you found in a thrift shop? <laughs> oh, that's, that, pretty, that's funny. Story. Oh. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon, very early, and John calls me up, and um, he's whispering, and he, I can almost imagine him holding his coat over his phone as he's whispering into the phone, and he, he says, Bet, I'm, I'm at a thrift shop way out here in North Raleigh, the Thieves' Market, and somebody in my church alerted me that there was something that looked like it might be Lighthouse involved um, out here at this market, and if there was only $12. So um, right after church, Aida and I came out here to see what it was, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's part of a bullseye panel of, of Fresnel lens, and I, I don't want anybody to hear me because they'll probably get real interested in it and come by it, snatch it away from us. So can you come out here and, and verify that this is what I'm looking at? And so um, my husband, Bill, and I, we went out there, and sure enough, two panels of the bullseye of um, a lighthouse lens. I know John was hoping it was Cape Hatteras, um, but at the same time we knew that the Cape Fear lighthouse lens um, was missing pieces as well. So it wasn't $12. I think it was $1,200 per each panel. And, um, I'll let John take it from here because he was the one who called the, um, the owner. We found out who the owner was while we were at the shop. John, you talked to him, right? Oh, oh, yes, yes. So, so Jeremy, this is going to be a hard one to keep short, but I will, I will do my best. It was a wonderful thing. So it was a Sunday morning at church. This uh, lady that we know, Diane McDaniel, that know I'm a lighthouse nut, came up and said that she had seen Thieves Market Mall. And it was one of those times when I was kind of like looking over her shoulder and saying, yeah, yeah. I thought it was some kind of a tchotchke or something you put on a knickknack shelf, you know, something like that. And she said, you know, she thought the price was maybe $12, but then she told me how large they were. She said they were about three, three and a half foot tall, and they were only about 10, 12 inches wide, and there were two of them. And it said that they were made in Paris in the 1800s. And at that point, I was looking straight in the eye. And uh, as, as Bette tells, told the rest of the story, Aida and I immediately drove down there and found them. And there they were among all of the uh, rooster teeth pots and, you know, uh, uh, crazy clocks and, and, and pot holders and everything else in this thrift shop, two original 
uh, flash panels uh, with the bullseye lens intact, very, very good condition. And it took uh, uh, two or three days to identify that they were from the Cape Fear Lighthouse on Bald Head Island. The lighthouse is no longer in existence because Oak Island took its place in 1958. But it was built in 19, uh, uh, 1903, and it had a full first order lens with 24 bullseye panels and I don't know how many catadioptric uh, prisms, but these were two full panels. And, the, and as Bet said, 1,275 each. I got the owner on the phone, Bill Paget and myself talked him down to 16, uh, 15 or 1,600 for both lenses. And uh, Aida and I bought one and Bet and Bill bought the other. And we have both promised to turn them over to World Head Island Foundation they are building a museum to display the entire lens and all of the panels they found, which is about a half, uh, maybe even three quarters. You never know what you're going to find in those places. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the, well, not a little bit, but maybe, maybe more than a little bit about the anniversary event that's about to come up. We're actually speaking on uh, December, what is today? December 3rd. Uh, people will be hearing this on the 9th which is exactly a week before your, your big event there. I understand it's going to be quite an event, but I'm not, I'm not really clear. Is this an in-person event or a virtual event or some of both? It will be mostly a virtual event. If the weather is nice enough, um, the live stream portion will be when the light comes on um, somewhere at around five. I think they want to begin the program at five. So if the light on in the tower comes on at 4 30 because of foul weather or something then i think they they're going to film the light coming on at another time so that that will be included in the virtual event the national park is cognizant of the virus and um, are taking precautions um, they they can't keep people away from the park and the grounds at that on that day. So um, the, there will be people there probably to witness um, the light coming on, but uh, the entire program itself is being filmed and will be um, displayed virtually. Mm -hmm. um, there is an exhibit that John is um, helping with tremendously of photographs of the history of the lighthouse um, that will be in the visitor center and that exhibit will be displayed until the spring of next year. I believe the shop um, closes at four o'clock, so they would have to get there before then if they wanted to see that exhibit or go another day. Besides the exhibit and the celebration of the light coming on on the 150th anniversary, what else is happening? It sounds like there's more on the program as well. In addition to that, uh, we've set up a, uh, um, just like we did for the 20th anniversary of the move, uh, a number of speakers, of course, Dave Halleck, uh, the superintendent, will speak first. And we have a number of island people and speakers, uh, some of them political, like uh, from the Board of Commissioners of Dare County, because it is also the 150th anniversary of Dare County, where the lighthouse sits. They were both formed in the same year at the same time. So that, that is a, quite a large event, and we're doing it in cooperation with them. But we also have speakers who are going to speak about the history of the lighthouse, a wonderful uh, author and well-known North Carolina filmmaker, Kevin Duffus will be speaking, and uh, several other people will be speaking along in um, an edited video that Current TV, the government uh, TV thing, has uh, donated their services. They're going to edit that together, so we'll have speakers. And in addition to the speakers, we will have people holding the happy birthday uh, signs with Betts music. In addition to the uh, live public history, uh, historic photographic tribute that I'm doing in the visitor center, there is also an online, and I think it's live already, uh, that Outer Banks Forever is doing an art show of people's interpretations of the lighthouse, photography and artwork that have been produced, and, and I've already seen it, and it's absolutely wonderful. It is. It's it's um, in conjunction with the Dare County Arts Council. Mm. Also, um, we're going to have a, a special um, little performance at the virtual um, celebration from Augustine Fresnel, who will have a special birthday wish as well. I've uh, actually met Monsieur Fresnel. Uh, I've seen <laughs> his uh, performance. <laughs> that That's a great addition as well. Obviously, the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society is playing a big role in this this event. 
Also, I believe the, the society is playing uh, a role in the upcoming restoration of the lighthouse that's happening next year, right? You mentioned it, John, a little yes. while ago. It's going to be a pretty pretty major restoration. Uh, you talked about the the removal of the paint and repainting, et cetera, inside and out. What what else is happening in that restoration? So one of the things, Jeremy, that a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, here we are at the 150th. Um, a lot of people think because the lighthouse was picked up and moved 2,900 feet back in 1999 that it had restoration done to it. But the truth is it has not. All of the restoration that's ever been done on that lighthouse, there's only been one time in 1991-92 when the same company, International Chimney, that moved the lighthouse did some major restoration to the ironwork at the top that was in very, very dire uh, condition. But they ran out of money and they didn't do everything that they had hoped to do. I actually did not know that this restoration was coming up, but it was already in the um, National Park Service's plans to, to replace ironwork, brickwork, windows, uh, stair treads, and those kind of things. When I wrote my own proposal and went to them not to do that sort of restoration, but to restore some of what's called the character-defining features of the lighthouse that are now missing that nobody knows about. There used to be beautiful cast iron pediments over the windows. They're gone and nobody even notices that they're missing. There used to be a beautiful Victorian iron fence around the lighthouse. That's gone and most people don't know it. It now has a white plastic fence around it. There used to be wooden doors, the only wood components of the whole lighthouse, both in the vestibule downstairs and up in the parapet uh, upstairs. Then there's the Fresnel lens, of course, that uh, had to be removed in 1949, and uh, it was replaced with an airport beacon. I propose that all of those things be done. You know, it is going to be an absolutely huge project. I, I would like to say that um, it was it was John's taking it upon himself to go to the National Park. It, the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society just gave our blessing. Um, we we did not help in writing any of his proposal or anything. He, he did that all on his own. Um, we just told him, you know, have at it. <laughs> yeah. And he did, and it was just amazing that, that they're willing to to restore it to what it looked like in 1870. I think that's great. Uh, it is a great accomplishment. Uh, again, congratulations, John, and everybody in, involved with that. I have a, a two-part question. I think you might want to take this bet, but John you might want to comment too. But I'm wondering, is the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society actively looking for volunteers? And secondly, how can people find out more information about that kind of thing? We're always looking for volunteers. We're, we're looking for members. We're looking for young members who have lots of energy so that they can volunteer. Um, there's always something that can be done. And the best way to get in touch with us and, and learn about us is through our website, our wonderful website that John built. And they can read about us and our accomplishments. We have a long growing list of accomplishments. They can read about um, some of the things that we are currently involved in. And um, th there's a contact page there where they can get in touch with us and find out more about how to become a member, um, how they can volunteer. And the website is? OuterBanksLighthouseSociety.org. And it also works if you just use OBLHS.org. So OBLHS.org right. or yes. OuterBanksLighthouseSociety.org. I have one more question for both of you. And of course, this is for bonus points. So Make sure your, your number two pencil is sharpened and ready to go. So again, this is for both of you. What have you enjoyed most about the work you do with Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and uh, even more generally with uh, the Outer Banks Lighthouses? I'll, I'll go first, okay? Um, I think one of the, well, several things I've enjoyed a lot, and I guess number one was learning about the lighthouses, learning about their history and about all of them. You know, as you know, I first came because of Hatteras Lighthouse, but then learning about all the other lighthouses, it was like a great big lighthouse world out there, and uh, just absorbing everything that I could about all the lighthouses. But um, for me, it's um, sharing 
what I have learned. I'm chair of the outreach committee and um, I've created programs that I give to children and to other people who are interested in lighthouses, other groups um, that I give talks to and share the history of the lighthouses and the stories. A lot of them are unprinted stories, those that you won't find in books. Um, that. Uh, I love sharing with, with those people and keeping their interest in our, our lighthouses. So, and as, as for John, I don't think he knew that there were any other lighthouses other than Hatteras. <laughs> it is true that my love is the Hatteras Lighthouse. The community that has built up around the lighthouses of North Carolina is, is enormous. And one of the wonderful things I found out when I joined the lighthouse, when I finally joined it, is some of the earliest members that Bruce and Cheryl brought into the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society didn't even live in this state. Numerous ones in Virginia. I'm one of the few Lighthouse Society board members that lives on the island now after my retirement. As I, as I do have one piece written for my book, the, the Hatteras Lighthouse particularly was like candles to a flame. Surfers, lovers, photographers, Easter uh, sunrise services that, that occurred at this lighthouse. It was really a community building thing. I think uh, Cape Hatteras in many ways is America's lighthouse. Some people might make an argument for Boston Light, which uh, is very near and dear to me being America's oldest light station. Yes. And a few others that are extremely prominent. Portland Head and Maine being visited, uh, I believe by more people than any lighthouse in the world. But it just uh, largely because of the move and because it's so striking visually and because it's so tall, et cetera, et cetera. Cape Hatteras, I think, uh, is really special to, to a lot of people. I want to thank you both very much for spending this time with me today, and I wish you all the best with the event that's happening on the 16th. Again, uh, good luck, and thank you so much, Bet and John. I appreciate it. We appreciate Thanks your having so us. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you for everything you do. It's, it's a wonderful thing to spread the word in this way, and, and we all appreciate it. Thanks again to our guests today, Bette Paget and John Havel of the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society. To learn more about their organization, go online to OuterBanksLighthouseSociety.org. We wish all the best to the National Park Service and everyone involved with next week's event, celebrating the 150th anniversary of Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. As always, thank you to the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Go to uslhs.org to learn about all the things the society has to offer. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider a donation to the U.S. Lighthouse Society to support it. Lighthearted will return on Monday with episode 94, which concerns the Chance Brothers Company in England, one of the most important manufacturers of Fresnel lenses for lighthouses. Until then, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Shine, let it shine